Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this episode features my friend, Dr. Craig Zamer, and we're talking about artistic block. You're going to love this episode because where else on the planet are you going to find artistic block talk to alongside with epic novelist and writer Stephen King. That's right. If you're listening back to episode 117 with Dr. Greg Lafice, you know all about what it is to transfer. Well, Dr. Zamer is also big into transfers, and he uses a lot of the concepts from writing to help us overcome artistic block as performers and concert creators. In this conversation, Craig's a blast to talk to, by the way. You're going to hear all about ideas for programming, ideas for overcoming block when it happens, and then at the end, y'all want to listen to the end, Dr. Zamer gives you one of the best end of episode tips ever. So don't worry if you are sitting here thinking, I have no idea what I'm programming or worse feeling. I've programmed all this stuff and it's not going to work. Don't worry. A, you're not alone. And B, this episode is going to help you get through artistic block and how to find your muse. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Kaleidoscope Adventures. If you're looking for something awesome to do next summer, Alex Gardner and I will be in Myrtle Beach hosting a youth choir festival, but not just singing. There's a whole professional development aspect too. We'd love to see you there. You can check out more in the link below. If you're just interested in more content, you know we just have that book, The Business of Choir, that was released. You can now find it on Amazon. Whoop, whoop. And of course, if you are looking for the best rehearsal tracks, jump over to the Kennison Coil Company. They make some of the most high quality and useful rehearsal tracks, not just for regurgitating what they learn, but also teaching learning concepts like count singing and solfeging and all that stuff. So enough of the announcements. Without further ado, because we're not going to procrastinate, we're going to find our programs and find our muse. My friend, Dr. Craig Zamer and how to overcome artistic block. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we are talking to one of my friends and awesome educators and fantastic presenters, Dr. Craig Zamer. Hey, Craig. Hello, Emmy. How's it going? I'm so excited for this. I have to, y'all listeners, I saw Craig do a presentation literally less than a week ago at Tennessee ACDA and cornered him as soon as it was over. I was like, we have to get this on a podcast episode. People need to hear this. Can you do it tomorrow? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> spoiler it's not tomorrow i was a little more nope. flexible <laughs> but i'm okay. so excited this is gonna yeah. be such a good conversation before we dive into all of the awesomeness about artistic block and finding our muse tell the listener who is dr craig zamer um well um i am currently the uh full professor and director of choral activities at tennessee tech university Um, That's in Cookville, Tennessee, and for those who may not know where Cookville is, um, it's about an hour and 15, uh, kind of either direction between Nashville and Knoxville. So we're kind of really quite smack dab in the middle of the state. Um, And I've been at Tennessee Tech, uh, I'm actually starting my 16th year um, at Tennessee Tech, which just does not seem possible. Um, Like my, my daughter was one um, when I started here and now she's a junior and it just doesn't seem right. My, my son, uh, I also have a son, Andrew, and he is, um, he was not born and he's now a freshman, um, in high school. So it's kind of incredible that they've grown up here this whole time and, and been part of the community for this, uh, long, um, uh, been happily married for, uh, 22 years. We, we luckily got, uh, my wife and I, uh, Katie, uh, we got married in Jul- on July 1 of 2000. So it's very easy for me to keep oh, track uh, of how many years we've been married because it's like, well, what year is it? Okay, that's how many years we've been married. Oh, um, I'm so jealous. I know. Well, yeah, that's, that's nice. <laughs> that's hard. My anniversary was yesterday and every year I'm like, okay, did I count right? <laughs> At least I picked a multiple of five. I thought right. that would help. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I, 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 I really appreciate because it makes my life a little a little bit easier. Do you do anything outside of your school job? Besides, I, I teach two undergraduate choirs. 
Um, I also teach, like I do all of the things choral at Tennessee Tech. So I teach choral literature, I teach choral conducting, and I teach uh, secondary choral methods uh, are the classes that I typically teach. Um, this coming semester, I, as I was telling you at the um, at Tennessee ACDA, um, I'm going to actually for the first time be teaching intro to music education this year. Um, so that's a sophomore level class for us, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this opportunity to kind of teach something new this fall. Um, but as getting to your actual question, I, I also direct um, the community chorus here in Cookville. They're called the Cookville Master Singers, um, and it's it's not exactly tied to the university, though, because of my position, we rehearse uh, at the music building and um, we do our concerts here um, at the Brian Fine Arts Building. And uh, but, uh, you know, we so we have some students who register for it as a class, um, but it's it's mainly an outlet for the community. Um, we've had we we have some high school students to recent graduates uh, who, you know, like if we have students who have like been in my choirs, but they uh, they end up with a job that's local or something along those lines. I've got several of my alumni that, that stick around and sing with us in that choir. And then I have all walks of life uh, from the mm -hmm. community, um, nurses, doctors, uh, businessmen, lawyers, uh, well, the whole gamut, you know, um, that uh, that are in the community choir. And we we primarily focus, we, we will do kind of larger orchestral work sometimes, but we, we're, we're not also um, above doing just a, a set of, you know, a concert with piano and choral octavos. Um, mm -hmm. So like this year, we're actually gonna be doing um, the Christmas portion of Messiah um, for the first half of our program, but then the second half, we're gonna be doing more like traditional hymns and carols and that sort of thing. The community really seems to enjoy those things. And so we want to make sure that that's, that's a part of my programming and understanding uh, my audience. And that kind of ties in with what we're talking about today. Um, but uh, this uh, for February, or it's actually early March, we do a unity in the community concert. Uh, and that's totally kind of taken directly from the Tallahassee community chorus. Um, when I was a uh, PhD student at FSU. Uh, one of my TA uh, ships was with the Tallahassee Community Chorus, um, and we had started that the Unity in the Community series, and that became something that I wanted to start as well. Um, we're only in our seventh season of Unity in the Community, but um, this concert is actually going to be a set of, um, it's, it's called Celebrating Diversity in Faith. Um, and um, we actually have kind of a an odd situation this year. Our our auditorium is going under renovation starting in October, and so we're not going to have our concert venue pretty much for the rest of the school year starting you know October one. And so that includes the the master singers. And so we're actually I'm working with a the local Fortunate Methodist Church here in Cookville. And I think they're going to kind of be our sponsor for all things choral. So my university choirs, the, the master singers, we're all going to be performing at their church this year. And as part of that collaboration, um, you know, I didn't want this to just be like, hey, can we use your church and, you know, like bring people in and, and all of this sort of thing without trying to give back in any way. Um, we're incorporating trying to use their church choir or some of their other youth choirs uh, in with our concerts. So it feels more collaborative rather than just like, Hey, let us borrow your space. Um, but for this, um, celebrating diversity in faith, I'm actually bringing in other local church choirs. Uh, and actually one of the things we're going to do collaboratively with that choir is we're going to do Paul Bassler's songs of faith. Um, and we're actually, we're getting Paul Bassler to come to, to Cookville. Hi. I talked to him this, this summer. And he was super amenable to doing it. He's really excited about coming up. So we're excited to have him. So he's going to be there. So cool. um, he, might, he might play horn on a few of his tunes. Um, and so we're pretty pumped about that. And then um, in the spring, Master Singers is actually going to be focusing on doing Elaine Hagenberg's uh, new piece, Illuminare. Beautiful. Um, that was a piece that the Festival Singers of Florida did last fall. They were part of the consortium that... Uh, commissioned that work 
Uh, and so I got to perform it last fall and performing it last fall. I was like, I can't wait till this piece is available so I can do it with one of my choirs. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it's a pretty exciting season for them and, and for my university choirs. And uh, I'm sounds pumped. like so much fun. I, I love that you brought up that collaboration piece, that it's not just, hey, can we use your ability? But let's make this a meaningful collaboration on both sides. And you've already given us a glimpse into what you do on your day to day and how it warrants the conversation we're having on finding your muse. So it sounds like you have everything in place for the season. But what then sparked this whole finding your muse conversation topic? Well, um, you know, like programming is is uh, for for all of us as choral educators, musicians, it is probably one of the most time consuming things that we can do, um, you know, to, to come up with a complete program. It can take days, weeks, months, um, just depending. I mean, but like sometimes we're in a time crunch and we have to like have a program in you know, a couple of days. And, and so we have that as well. And there's kind of a pressure associated with that. Um, I didn't have any pressure associated with uh, this past summer, but typically, you know, I get through uh, the end of the spring semester and I try to give myself like a week or two to just kind of decompress. Uh, but then I, I, you know, I come back to the office and I start to look through things. Um, you know, if I've gone to a convention or something, looking back through programs and and, you know, like if I've marked a specific piece to kind of go back and look at that piece and just to kind of grab some ideas as to kind of where to start. And then that kind of starts the ball rolling as far as my programming. Well, you know, I it was probably nearing the end of May. And um, on the one hand, I, I had it somewhat easy because in my programming for this, for my university choirs, um, for the fall, we actually, we are also really fortunate that we're going to be, we're a part of a consortium as well with Kyle Peterson. Um, and he has recently written a multi-movement work called And Justice for All. And so we're going to be premiering that work in late October. And so, but when bringing him, he's going to do a residency. He's going to be here at Tech for a couple of, a couple of days, work with my choirs, give some lectures, that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, so when he's coming, this falls right in line also with my fall concert. So in, in some ways this was a little bit easier because I knew I wanted to do several pieces by Kyle, um, you know, like to kind of feature him since the, the fact that he's here, the fact that we're premiering a work, I wanted to showcase his breadth and depth as a writer, uh, by having both of my university choirs performing pieces by him. Um, but I didn't also want it to be exclusively him. So I, you know, I had to choose music, um, that plus, um, we started just this past summer, we started something called, we, something we call the summer music Institute here at tech. Um, it's for high school students and, uh, it's basically like a summer camp, um, here in Tennessee, governor's school for the arts is really big. Um, and you know, they have a program for choir, they have a program for orchestra, they have a program for band. Um, it's a month long intensive. Um, my daughter who plays oboe was, uh, actually, she got to go to governor's school when she went for oboe. Um, although she also sings. So happy about that. Important um, note. I know. Um, but a month is a long time. And so the Tennessee tech has been doing the summer music Institute for many years, but there's never been a choral component to that. Well, this, this year we started to, um, we, we tried to have a vocal choral component. And, you know, in our first year, we were pretty fortunate. We had like uh, 12 people register for the, for the summer camp. And, you know, starting out 12 sounds like, okay, yeah, not bad. But also 12 meant, okay, I have 12. I'm not sure how many of these people are sopranos, altos, tenors, or basses. You know, I see, I see four what I believe to be male voice names. Um, but I don't know. And I don't know if all of them are tenors, all of them are basses. What am I going to have? And so I found myself, um, kind of stuck in, in programming for, for everything. I was kind of stuck with the master singers program. I was, I was stuck picking the pieces that weren't Kyle Peterson music, uh, in my programming. And, uh, and then 
I was kind of stuck with, okay, what do I do with this unknown choir of 12 uh, that I know is coming in, but I want it to be exciting. I want it to be fun. Um, and I want it to be successful. You know, I want the, the kids to walk away from, from the experience feeling like they got a good experience out of it. Um, and so as I was sitting there struggling, um, and I, you know, I also sit on the, the Tennessee ACA board as the membership chair. Um, and we had had a meeting, uh, it was back at the beginning of May, I think, and we had started talking about the summer conference and what we were going to do and kind of the, the topic of flexibility. And as I was sitting there kind of struggling with my own programming, um, it kind of caused me to kind of reflect on, okay, well, this is not the first time this has happened to me. And I think for like all of your listeners, this, this happens frequently. Um, and so I was like, you know, what if I just kind of made a presentation about my process or the things that I've kind of gone through? And then maybe we also have a moment in that session to, to open it up and hear what other people's experiences are. And just kind of through that experience of that collective experience that we all share uh, to kind of look at this problem of artistic block and see if, if there are some commonalities. Are there, are there some things that we can really latch onto and say, okay, um, you know, I'm stuck. And rather than just sitting there and going, I'm stuck and beating your head against the wall and just feeling hopeless, you know, are there things that we can, that we can discuss or, or think about that can get us past that block? And what I loved about what you just brought full circle is why this presentation, you've already given us so many examples. You had blockage because you had very specific requirements for a a concert around a composer. You had blockage because you had a very specific um, singer in front of you or type of, like you had very small numbers in front of you. And then you also talked about knowing your audience and knowing your location. All the examples you've given us up to here, even as we've been getting to know you, you've been giving us examples of, okay, you found a really good collaboration and a way to make a concert meaningful to your community by doing a piece of a major work, but also touching on what your community wants, which is hymns and familiar tunes at the holiday times. But you're also bringing in other ensembles and other choirs to be a part to make it a meaningful collaboration. Like you're already giving us lots of tips. <laughs> what I love too about this, before we get dive deeper into some more ways to overcome the artistic block, in the overview of your presentation, you said, we'll talk about programming a concert, what causes the artistic block, and strategies for overcoming. You've given us those three things already, but then you took us on a deep dive into something that we've never heard in a choir presentation before. We must bring this to the surface, my friend. Please tell the listeners on the side, what are your hobbies? Yeah, um, well, so, and actually this, this kind of fits with uh, one of your more recent podcasts. I was telling you, I just listened to your podcast with um, Dr. Greg Lafice, and he was talking about transfer. Well, as I was trying to come up with, well, you know, how am I gonna talk about this? Um, I was trying to think about what, you know, like where to go with this. Well, um, you know, again, being an FSU grad and thinking in ways of transfer, it's like, okay, well, where can I, where can I draw commonality from? And, uh, my hobby, one of, one of my hobbies, uh, is that I, I am a, an avid Stephen King fan. Um, I've read almost all of his books, um, and I know that possibly I've just turned off about half of your audience, maybe even more, I don't know, by hearing the, the name Stephen King, just by the, the stereotypical no. um, like idea of he's kind of like that gross, horror, gory guy. Um, but, but really, if you, if, you look, if you can look past the gore and the horror of some of his stories, it's, it's really his storytelling and the depth of his storytelling that really gets me. Um, my daughter has actually started to recently read Stephen King and she was talking about like the realism that he writes with, you know, that like the things that he talks about is not just like, I mean, there, he's written some fantasy books and that sort of thing. So there are definitely things that kind of feel fictional, but there's something about the, the human out, the human aspect of how he writes or who he writes about. Um, and, and just how like, yeah, this, this can happen or has happened in the past, you know, even though this is a fictional book, but like the topics and, and again, just like 
development of characters and just like, you know, that, that moment, that, that golden mean moment, somewhere there two thirds in the book. Uh, and he just like completely turns something and you just have this amazing aha moment about how he's built up to this moment. And then all of a sudden there's this realization and it just becomes like something completely new. And so for me, um, and, and actually, uh, part of the presentation, I, I quoted some things from uh, one of his nonfiction books that Stephen King wrote. It's called On Writing. Um, Which I've been and, listening to, by the way, since last week. I'm about halfway through. Very good. Not typical. I mean, great Stephen King writing, but not what I would expect from him. Great right. book, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and that book starts with kind of an autobiography. He talks about, like, the beginning of his uh, writing career and how he kind of got lucky into, you know, uh, getting those first books published and it just kind of snowballed from there. But then he actually talks about the process of writing. Um, and within this book, he, he starts to talk about, uh, writer's block. And so, you know, like, again, being someone who's constantly, uh, thinking about transfer, you know, I talk to my students and we, we talk about transfer in my classes as well. And um, I'm also, and I, I mentioned this in uh, my presentation, that I'm also like a super like movie buff. I love movies. Uh, and so oftentimes, I mean, it's, and also like, uh, I think choral directors can relate to this, that like someone will say something or uh, like, like a phrase will come up or there's like a line of text in the song that we're working on at the moment and it immediately makes you think of like a song and then you immediately start to sing that song or the lyric from that Guilty. song. And it so just happens like you, you, you don't even have it's, it's like non-controllable. It just happens. Right. right. It's like when and people so, say stop, you have to be like collaborate and listen. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. And it's like the inflection, too. There's like something about the way it was said that just like makes you think of that that song. Um, and it's it's very much say, the same way for me and movies that, you know, like something will come along and, and I'll, I'll immediately think uh, of some sort of movie. And so. Literally, when I when I came up with the title of Finding Your Muse, and God, it was a hilarious technological failure uh, at the beginning of my presentation for Tennessee ACDA. But I, I found like when I when I thought of my title, Finding Your Muse, I immediately thought of Dom DeLuise in The History of the World Part One uh, when he's playing Julius Caesar um, and. Um, and he, he like stands up just like randomly and he's like, the muse is upon me. And uh, I tried to play that <laughs> clip in my presentation, but like there were things going on with the airplay or something and you couldn't see the screen. And then it ended up like looping three oh, or four times. It ended times. up being exceptionally humorous, <laughs> like extra humorous. And now I have said that little line about a dozen times since then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, like, and that's, that's just the way my brain works is like, you know, like, and, and so um, that kind of built the transfer between, okay, artistic block. And I kind of immediately thought about this book um, by Stephen King on writing and his discussion of uh, writer's block. And then basically what I've kind of coined as artistic block. Uh, I think uh, I, I was looking online and people refer to it like artists, artist block or something like that. Um, but when I was trying to come up with like, what do we call this? It's not writer's block. Um, I decided to, to call it artistic block. Mm -hmm. That's ex it's perfect. And yeah. some of the quotes you had, I think I wrote down two of them were my favorite. There was the, to be a writer, you must do two things above all else, read a lot and write a lot. And that's so true for what we do as programmers of music and as choral people. Right. So important. Yeah. I mean, and that transfer can be a part of like for someone who's writing music, right? Okay. I mean, the writer to writer. You know, if you're going to write music, you should, you know, you should write a lot. You should write a lot of music, even if you think it's good, bad, indifferent, whatever. Um, you should also, you know, look at a bunch of other music. Well, the same can be said, even if we're not composers, um, as choral music educators, if we're going to program, right, and our, our writing is our storytelling, right, that we do through programming, um, then in order for us to get better at programming, that means that we need to program a lot. Um, maybe, you know, like even just kind of thinking down the road, you know, rather than getting to that point where we, we start and we're like, okay, I have no clue where to start. Uh, you know, I, it would be an interesting idea to just like sit down and like program stuff just to 
program it. And then like have your little like toolbox of like, okay, well, I came up with this program. Does this fit with something, you know, or, or, or pieces like that. Um, and the other thing, so read a lot and uh, read a lot, write a lot. And basically what we talked about is writing, but the read a lot means that we need to be consumers of choral music, right? We need to listen to lots of choral music and whether it's, it's listening to, um, you know, great recordings by renowned choirs, or if it's just getting on YouTube and listening to amateur choirs or high school choirs, college choirs, university choirs, uh, community choirs, whatever. I mean, there's there's a ton of choir on YouTube. There's a ton of everything on YouTube, but um, it's such a, you know, it's it's such a, a free, great place to start. Yeah, too. It's a free resource, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, you know, just putting in the search bar a, a specific composer and choir. Um, that's a random way to just kind of listen and consume music. But I think as as music educators, we can't we can't become complicit with our own knowledge of music and think that that's going to last us a, a career's worth of time in programming. You know, we're, right. we're going to run out of ideas. We're going to run out of pieces. So we constantly need to be listening and looking for new new pieces of music. Again, I think that's one of the main reasons why I think going to conventions and that sort of thing are so important because, I mean, you're there and what almost everything you do is consuming choral music, whether it's through performance or through, uh, you know, lectures and discussions or clinicians speaking about various things and they give examples of music. Um, It's just several days of just living, living choir. Um, And if you look at it in that perspective, it's almost a different, so often we get to those conferences and there's almost a burnout, like you've over listened. But if you look at it from the perspective of you're filling up your cup to help avoid artist block later, artistic block later. That's a huge point. But I actually went back to this quote when I was programming just recently because I didn't know where to start. I had too many things swirling in my head. So I just pulled up one of my favorite choir tunes that I'm always waiting for the choir that's ready to do this piece. I'm not going to tell you what it is because when that choir comes and they're ready for that piece, but it's my favorite piece on the planet. And anytime I don't know what to do, I start with that one and it just gets me so excited to program because then I think, okay, well, everything I program this season could be building so that next year I have the choir that can do this piece. There you you never know when it comes yeah. out, man, the whole world's going to know I'm doing Absolutely. that piece. But the other quote that I really like too, because this whole consuming and listening, that's been helpful for me on this end. The other one is where you wrote, I believe stories are found things like fossils in the ground. So yesterday when I was programming, I took seven walks, seven seven and I'm like there's gonna be music in the ground (laughs) I am ready to clear my mind because you had given us a story of Stephen King walking and that's how he kind of got through some writer block so I would get stuck and I'd be like I'm just gonna go for a walk my dog loved it by the way it was his favorite day ever but that really did help I kept walking and I got back and man those rep lists just poured out after walk number uh, seven. I mean, and you know, like what, if we're talking about the, the practicality of things and we're, and we're looking for solutions, um, the story I told came once again from um, Stephen King's on writing where he, he was writing the stand. Um, and uh, for those of you who may know, or if, if you've seen like the TV miniseries, there was a, a recent re uh, remake of uh, the stand. Uh, I forget what, uh, what channel it was created on. Um, but there was a, a recent revamp of The Stand as a miniseries. Um, but of course, it was a book. It was one of the early books that Stephen King wrote. Um, and it's over a thousand pages. Uh, and I think that's, that's, one of the, uh, <laughs> that's one of the stereotypes about Stephen King is he's kind of long-winded. I mean, you look at his books. And, I mean, my, I have like a bookshelf that is devoted just to Stephen King's You have, don't books, have much room I, for much else if you put Stephen King. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you gotta like put extra supports under there so the wood doesn't sag because it's just heavy. Um, right, lots of words. He's wordy, yeah. but that's his storytelling. Right. And it it was so good to use his examples on writer's block to then help us get through. And it all makes total sense because if he's writing thousand plus work page novels. He's going to need a lot of connective pieces. He's going to need some big circles. So you went from these quotes and these transfers to Stephen King into 
talking about ways to program. And you just gave us a list of ways that you program. Could you run us down your list? And then I think I wrote down the couple others that were added. Okay. Yeah. And I also kind of, as I, after our, my presentation and we had that collaboration, I also tried to hopefully make some notes. So we'll, we'll compare and see if, if yeah. I caught everything. Um, so yeah, I, I basically move into, okay. So if, well, and I think it's really important for us to realize, and sometimes we forget that as choral musicians, even though we're the one with the back to the audience, that we are artists uh, in what we do. And um, though we're not the one with the voice, uh, you know, performing for the audience, it, it's our students and our ensembles that perform for the audience. Um, we still have a voice within the choir because we have put this program together. And whether, whatever it is that you're trying to say um, with your programming, that's, that's your artistic voice, or what, at least one of your artistic voices uh, as a choral music educator. So I, I kind of moved into, okay, so what, what kind of story are you trying to, to take? Or what story are you trying to make um, out, of, out of your program? And so I basically just kind of came up with some ideas. And basically, like everything in my presentation, good or bad, are things that I've done. Um, so like they're, they come from my experiences or the, the types of programs that I've tried to do. And then basically from my own experiences, I wanted to hopefully catch like, yeah, yeah, I've had that same experience too. So um, the first thing, and again, I'm drawing the parallel between Stephen King and, and choral music, which again, yeah, like that's just transfer, not something transfer, you're transfer. ever going to hear at some other clinician's talk. Um, but, you know, maybe our concert, your storytelling is a series of short stories. Um, you know, like Stephen King has several short story compilations. There's a book called Everything's Eventual, um, Nightmares and Dreamscapes. Um, there are several others, um, but basically they're just a book of, of short stories in there. You know, it's something that didn't get flushed out into a full novel. Um, and they can just, I mean, they don't relate to each other at all. They're just, you know, like you finish one and then you go somewhere completely different. And I think in our programming, sometimes we can choose a program that's like that, you know? So um, another movie quote that, that throws into my mind there is Monty Python's Flying Circus. And now for something completely different um, is basically the, the way that we look at that kind of programming, right? So it, it doesn't have to have any kind of meaning or flow. It, it's just a series of short stories. And maybe you it could be like a centerpiece concert where you still have like this one piece that sits in the middle of your program. And like, that's the thing you're really trying to say. And then it's just about building contrast around that, that central piece. Um, so you have like a series of short stories. That, that was one of my, my first example. And then I gave an example of maybe in your storytelling, maybe you, you have to fill a longer program. Um, like maybe you're taking your choir on tour and you need to have like 45 to an hour's worth of music. And okay, that's, that's hard to like have either one central theme or even just like keeping up with just contrast throughout the whole thing. Um, so maybe you have sets of songs, right? And so rather than everything just being completely different, maybe you have sets of similar stories, right? So and this would be like in your programming, you use Roman numeral one um, and you have a set of songs that kind of go together. And then you have Roman numeral two and then these songs kind of go together. And then you have Roman numeral three and then those also kind of go together. So there's kind of like mini themes within just a, a larger uh, concert, but there's not necessarily like a common thread throughout the whole thing. So you just kind of have this structure for a longer program. Um, then, so those first two, I would consider on the, if, if I could classify these as like easy to difficult, I would, I would put like the random short stories because again, you're, you're completely free, you know? And I think it's, it's the freedom that helps us not have these artistic block moments, but it's when we really are trying to focus in on a specific theme or a specific idea that we can start to get ourselves locked up because we, we can only do certain pieces of music that will fit our theme. And so the next thing that I said was concerts built around a, a central theme. So this could be, 
you know, again, you, you're a high school or middle school choir director and you have three or four ensembles that you direct throughout the course of the day or you have a, an after school ensemble and they're incorporated in your concert. And so you have different kinds of choirs, but you want to share some sort of either general theme uh, about the program. I mean, and even a general theme can just kind of be like music from around the world, uh, which is which is also kind of a freeing uh, exercise in programming because, you know, that that just means that you once again can pick almost anything because, you know, as long as it's coming from different areas of the world, uh, that sort of thing. Um, it can be more specific, but like, okay, so you have a multi-choir concert and it's built around a central theme. Um, one, of, one of the things that came up, and, and it's why I ended up talking about the Kyle Peterson piece that we were doing um, at the presentation, um, is that, okay, so maybe you have a concert that's centered around a specific composer. Or uh, my community choir last year, um, for our Unity concert, we did um, all music by women composers. Um, and so even though that wasn't one specific composer, I, you know, obviously there were some limitations. Uh, I mean, although there's a, a wealth uh, of music out there, but we wanted to celebrate uh, the, again, the, the depth of writing that's, that's out there by women composers. Um, so it could be like one specific composer it can be a little bit broader, uh, like I just gave an example. Um, one thing that I hadn't really thought of, and this was brought up at the presentation, was, okay, so say, you know, you have a Veterans Day program, or you have, like, just some sort of school assembly, and the principal has asked you to sing, you know, for this assembly. So your, your program is one piece, maybe two, like, maybe max three pieces. Um, right. I know sometimes my, my top choir, the Tech Corral, um, we've been invited to sing for, like, the College of Business, and they have a they have a guest speaker, and there's a dinner, and they want entertainment. So we come out and we sing, and we typically do like a three piece concert. Uh, so we go out there, and you know, literally at that point, I'm I'm taking from the stuff I've already programmed, and kind of figure like, okay, well, this will be entertaining for our program. But but again, if you're just programming for a specific event, and you you're limited even by the number of pieces you can choose. Um, that's a that's another kind of concert and that that also has some considerations for the music that you choose and and whether that's going to be easy or difficult i think um, along those same lines too before you go on to the last one it, especially as we're starting the school year like for me for my community ensembles i don't know who's going to be there i don't know yeah. how many singers what type of singers or how experienced they're going to be i have an idea of what singers are coming back but i don't know what new singers will be joining us, what levels they will be in, what voices have changed over the summer in a <laughs> right. variety of ways. And sure. we do a kickoff like fundraiser mini concert sharing session thing the right after the first three open rehearsals. So I'm almost programming in three columns for my community ensembles. Mm -hmm. The one column is what I call the quick teaches, the Dr. Bowers one hit wonders that you can just throw out there. They pick it up by rote or rote observation. And then I have the second column, which is the beginnings of music literacy. These are pieces that we can use at some of these sharing events or maybe save for the spring concert if they work or just use them for music literacy and toss them out and never use them again. They're almost kind of let me gauge and see where we are. And then I have my list of here's the rep I'm hoping we're going to do, but I don't actually pull the trigger on any of that until the 1st of September which is always a little scary because I don't know how many to order, how long it's going to be on background. And I usually end up having two to three times more music than I'm going to need. And so the order of which things go together, that becomes my artistic block as we move in throughout the year because I'm having to choose from a list, like a, you know, choose from this large list right. that I know I'm, I'm excited about programming, but I don't want that. I don't always want to do random short stories. Sometimes those work great. Right. But I think that that's another element of the puzzle is what do you need for right now? What do you need to help them get to the next level musically, artistically, as a community? Because, of course, at the same time, all of this is community building because most of my singers don't know each other from Adam and don't go to the same school. And then the last is how is that all going to fit into a concert? So it's it's like this tornado of sorts that you got to <laughs> pluck out the right thing. Yes. Any and any plates spinning at the same yeah, time. Yeah, and that whole freedom of it when it gets started – that's my issue is getting started when there's so much freedom. That's why listening to music, going for a walk, or starting these columns usually helps me. 
But what you're saying here, this last one, that was my saving grace when I was programming for college choirs. Mm -hmm. Because that, th you have to tell them about this last one, because that, that was my, my f I would always turn it into a sentence, and the sentence would be the epic story that we were telling in each yeah. part of the sentence. But you tell about the epic story. That's okay. So yeah, like the, the last thing, and again, kind of building the, the connection to Stephen King, there are, uh, he, he has written, and actually probably one of my favorite sets of books that he's written is uh it's a series it's seven books it's so it's like kind of like harry potter in that way um but it's this epically long story called the dark tower um and he 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 wrote it uh over many many years uh but talking about this kind of epically just like connected thorough um story uh, and, and when I think about these kind of epic stories or themes that have connection, there's evolution um, throughout the whole thing. Um, that makes me think about some of the most like impactful performances that I've witnessed. And oftentimes those things happen at ACDA conventions. Um, and it's just like mm -hmm. you, the, the, the conductor's uh, artistic uh, vision is realized on that stage. And so you're not only blown away by the choir's ability to sing well and perform well, mm. but it's that connection, what either with a central theme or without a central theme, but just the, the, Story. the storytelling yeah. that can go through some of those, you know, and whether it, it, it in, in, uh, involves like visual things mm -hmm. that are a part of the performance, whatever that, that elevates that performance to this like epic stature. Or just the involvement of the singer. Like you think about when the Aeolians broke ACDA in Kansas City, <laughs> it was legitimately an epic story from beginning to end, yeah. unlike anything you'd ever seen before. But there, there've been other really monumental experiences. I think of, this was a small little retreat, but there's a children's and youth choir directors retreat every other year. And I remember seeing Linnell Joy Jenkins conducting her ensemble when we were in New Jersey. And it was this thread of music from beginning to end. And it was woven so perfectly, just every transition, every movement of the choir to the new formation. UK, um, their men's ensemble does this as yeah. well. I yeah. don't remember what conference, it might've been Miami, I don't remember which conference, but yeah. it's huge, big burly humans on this stage. <laughs> and they're just like, boosh, new position, and you didn't hear their feet. Yep. And I remember in my early days of teaching, I would try to mod, like I found videos of it because I would be like, y'all, look at how huge these humans are and they don't make any noise when they're moving. Let's do the UK thing. So we'd call it our UK feed. <laughs> but those stories are, that's a really big piece. And you've given, so you've given us the four, you know, the short stories, a combination of longer stories. You've given us the theme, weaving it together, the big epic novel stories of lots of them together. But then where you went from here in the presentation was awesome because then you gave us all the different reasons and causations that you could think of for artistic block. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And um, so, you know, I, I think and, and one of the things that I talked about was, OK, so given our choices, whatever we're, we're doing with our programming, if you come up with, OK, I'm going to do the short story thing or I'm going to do I'm working on this epic story that I'm, I'm trying to tell um, that our choices uh, on what kind of concert we're going to create can contribute to the causation of artistic block where we can just kind of like either back ourselves into a corner with our programming um, because we're trying to be overly specific. Um, and, and I think it's also important to realize that artistic block uh, doesn't happen at any specific time. Like you've already said, right? Um, you, it was, how do I start, right, at, at the beginning? So like right. literally, it can be right at the beginning. I have no idea what to do with my choir this year. You know, like, and, and I, I, I talked about this as one of the causations um, you know, if you're a veteran teacher and you've been teaching for over 20 years and you kind of feel like you've, you've done it all, um, you know, and you've even maybe reused a few pieces here and there and, and you're just kind of like, you know, like, okay, I and mean, particularly like even in my position. So I'm starting my 16th year at Tennessee Tech. And so I also have kind of felt like, okay, I, you know, I, I've been fighting the good fight for 15 years and I've been, you know, 
creating this and okay, this year has been different and, and I'm always trying to like one up myself. That's the, that's the other thing that's always so tricky, right? Like we have this great concert and then you have to go, how do I top this? How do I make it better next year? Right? Exactly. Uh, the competition um, within ourselves. Ah. Right. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we're our worst enemy when it comes to something like that. Um, so it can happen at the beginning. It can happen somewhere in the middle. Um, it could be just like that, that final piece that we're missing in the program. It's that one last piece and we just can't find the piece that needs to, to fall into that place. So uh, it can happen at any time. Um, and, and so, like I said, going along with the, the cornering ourselves, like, so maybe our theme is a little bit too specific. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're trying to find this one piece that's going to, that's going to tie everything together, right? You've got like, I've got my centerpiece, right? This is, this is the heart of my program. I've got that. And then I've got these cool connecting pieces, like at the beginning, and I've got this cool, awesome closer that I'm really excited about. But like, what do I do after? Like, okay, the impact of this central piece, how do we, how do we come back from that? You know? Right. Or like you bring in the central piece that you're so excited about and the ensemble before you isn't the one for that piece. Right. It's that yeah, whole trying to fit the square peg in the circle right. hole. Yeah. Or that again, thing. like, like you said, not necessarily knowing what's coming in. Right. So you've mm -hmm. got like these great ideas, but you have no idea whether the choir is actually going to be capable of it. And then you have that terrible moment. Uh, and I, I, this, again, coming from my own experience yeah. this past year, I mean, with COVID and everything, uh, our numbers have been smaller uh, in our in our choirs. I'm happy to say that our numbers are way up uh, this, this coming year. So that's another reason for me to be excited about this fall. Um, but my numbers were low and I had programmed some music and we hit that first rehearsal and I was working on one of the pieces that I considered easy, like you said, like the quick learns, you know, like we'll start with this. It's a good place to start. And as we're going through this, I'm like that other piece that I programmed for this choir, that's like going to be one of the central pieces to my program. Not we're not going to be able to happen. do it. We're not going to be able to do it well, and they're not going to be happy with it. And so, like, you have that dreaded moment where number one, you have to go back to the drawing board and find mm -hmm. something else, and then mm -hmm. you have that terrible moment where you have to say, "Okay, everybody, hand that piece back in." Like and a I'm moment of defeat. Piece. And but here's the thing, and I, I think this is an important thing that listening to everyone give feedback as you would present these ideas and let the room weigh in. You know, something that you didn't put on your slides but was brought up was the idea that there's there's physical things going on and mental things going on in our lives that can impact the artistic creativity or there's situations yeah. and restrictions at a, at a location that are restricting what you can or can't choose. So it was interesting to hear the whole room just, you know, chewing on, oh, it's okay, we're not in this together. And the big epiphany, no one else in the room really cares that you're passing in that piece of music. Maybe that one really invested choir singer who's thinking they're going to be a music major, they're a little bummed. Right. But they're a little bummed. <laughs> like, yeah. that's it. Nobody but, else but really You're, cares. like, completely wrecked because right. you just, like, I yeah. gave up on the piece. <laughs> and it's so funny. I was with my family this past weekend, super quick whirlwind trip to see family. And I was spending some time with one of my aunts who is a musician, has played in symphonies her whole life, and just was like, so I was wondering, how do you pick your repertoire? <laughs> I just looked at her with like, I'm so sorry. It is 8.30 in the morning. I haven't had enough coffee. <laughs> there are multiple classes to explain it. But can I just say that's like what we go to school for? And it's always evolving and always changing. And it's, it's an art and a science. And it's never all the way right. And it can always improve. But whatever comes out is always a good concert because people are together singing. Absolutely. Yep. And again, it, it's like the, the quote that you talked about them being fossils in the ground, these, mm -hmm. these programs that it's there. The program is there. We just sometimes have to work a little bit harder. We have to be a little bit more meticulous. Yeah. Um, Careful with the brush. Don't ruin it. Exactly. Right. You don't want to break the. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had like that picture from Jurassic Park of them. That was <laughs> yes. the other because, again, me and my movies and, and stuff like that. That's what I when I hear that quote. That's what I think about is. Did you ever, speaking of movies, we'll tie it all together with a movie. There was a documentary on Disney about the making of one of the animated. It might have been Frozen 2, I think. And they, you talk to all of the different people working on it. And they talk about how it's never perfect. Even the final movie that we all saw, that we know and love, was not perfect. And there is a level of perfection that we all expect from ourselves because we love choir. 
we love teaching and that there's a piece of this artistic block is just let go. Sometimes it's like writing that silly dissertation. Just get words on a page. Dr. Madsen always says it's not your opus one. This is not the only concert you're ever going to program. <laughs> For sure. You can always switch. No one died because you switched pieces. It's just right. choir. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I mean, like, on the one hand, it can be very serious and we, you know, like we, we can, and actually that can be another con, con, contributor mm -hmm. right? yes. uh, of artistic block is like, again, we're kind of getting our own way that like, no, this has got to be perfect. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, like what I have on the page is just not perfect. And, and so you're like beating yourself up about it because it's not perfect. But right. again, yeah, I mean, like nothing. Really get out of your own way type of deal. Whatever it is, yeah, exactly. Such a good thing. And I am guess, I mean, I know this is the case for the book we just wrote. There was, I mean, the number of times they sent it to us for final edits, and we're like, oh, there's one more thing. Oh, there's one more thing. And finally the editor was yep. like, there's always going to be one more thing, but we think it's pretty great. So there is power. <laughs> I mean, part of, I think, what got me through the artistic block of this season was having seen you do this presentation and know, Huh, there's others out there that have artistic block and there's others out there that it's going to be October. You're going to pull a piece back in and you're going to pull something out of your back pocket. And you know what? It's going to be okay. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Exactly. It'll be okay. Oh, this is such a fun conversation. I'm thankful that you were willing to jump on and share like a super fast version of this great presentation. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's my pleasure. I've, I've been a long time listener um, you. to your podcast. And so the fact that I get to be on here is, is great and always love talking with Yemi. Well, you know better than anyone then that at the very end, I let the guest say one thing that really matters. So what is the one thing you want the listener to walk away from today with? Well, I, I think if there's a way to kind of sum up like artistic block and are there solutions uh, to, to artistic block? Because again, we can go back to that Dom DeLuise quote, the muse is upon me. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and think, okay, well, you know, really, what is, is the only solution for this to be, we just have to wait around until inspiration hits us in the back of the head. And then we like, oh, now we have the idea. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing to think about is you've got to change something about whatever it is that you're doing. So whether it means that you need to walk away from the project for a little bit, you need to go on seven walks or whatever, like you're kind of hitting that wall and, and instead of sitting there just beating your head against the wall, it's a, that, that old Einstein quote that uh, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different right. results. Um, mm -hmm. That, that you, you, you've got to change. Um, and whether, whether that be um, the activity or, you know, like you said, the environment is too noisy. Like uh, the other day, I had some students practicing in the classroom right across the office from, from my office, and I was trying to work on something and it just wasn't happening. I had to move on to a different activity that didn't take the concentration that I needed in that moment. Um, it, so that kind of change or, you know, rethinking what, uh, what is possible with your programming. And I think one of the last things that I kind of left the, the, the conference with was, you know, look at things you might have not normally looked at. Um, like when I had my choir of 12 for the Summer Music Institute, I, I knew, again, I had no idea what that choir was going to be like. And I knew that we were going to have a vocal, like solo vocal component to that week um, that we had for our, our summer camp. And so I thought, what if I just take uh, some Italian arias and turn them into a choir piece? And so I took like, so I took something that normally it's not a choir piece, right? I, I took two right. uh, Caldara arias, Alma del Corre and uh, Come Raggio di Sol, and, and actually like Frankenstein them together. I took the A section from Alma del Corre. Awesome. I took the A section from Come Raggio di Sol and then put the A section of Alma del Corre back but the, the, the tessitura, we, we did Alma del Corre in the high key, so it favored the sopranos and tenors, whoever I had. Okay? And then uh, Come Raggio di Sol was in the low key, so it favored the altos and basses. Um, but then I basically just gave phrases of the solo to the sections where the tessitura worked. You know? And so we, we turned this into, and so there were like sections, and there were sections that they all sang together. So we had 2D sections. But we had like solo sections for each uh, section and we just made it work, you know, like so 
So looking at things with a different perspective, but, but like, I think everything comes back to change. Wh whatever you're doing, whatever, wherever you're stuck, um, something's got to change. Uh, and that's, that's the, the way out, uh, as, as far as I, I can see. I love it. That's, that's tangible, usable knowledge. And we're not alone in this. Hey, Craig, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, it's been my pleasure. I mean, uh, again, longtime fan, and uh, thanks for having me. Anyone else hearing that song in your head? I want to be the change I want to see in the world. That song that was really popular. If you haven't found that, go over to Coremore, Be the Change. It's a fantastic piece. Anyway, change. If you are stuck, change. If the piece isn't working, change. It is choir music. It is music. It's not going to not going to be the end of the world if you change something if you pick a different piece if you go a different direction yeah it might be disappointing to you i mean there's this one piece y'all when i program it everyone's gonna know because i'm gonna be so excited that i finally have a choir that can do this piece of music i'm not gonna tell you what it is you have to stay tuned but whether you are overcoming artistic block because you're a new teacher and you're not sure what else to pick or you're a veteran teacher and you've done it all or you're just a little on the burnout side or your theme's a little too narrow or you're just concerned about what's going to actually be the, the concert your audience wants to hear. I hope that this episode has given you some ideas for how you can change, how you can pivot how you can look in the ground and find those fossils, find those pieces that are going to make you and your ensemble what they need to be this year. So. In case no one has told you today, you, my friend, you matter. We all know that music matters, especially the repertoire that we program for our ensembles. And I will see you next time on the Music Ed Matters podcast. <laughs>